And now, <laughs> it, is, it is my great privilege to introduce a very longtime friend of mine, Mr. Keith McHenry, who I've known since the 80s. Mm -hmm. And in, I'll say a couple words about Food Not Bombs as well. Uh, Food Not Bombs is now a worldwide organization. They're virtually isn't the city virtually almost anywhere in the world that does not have a chapter of uh, Food Not Bombs. And it is a typical anarchist uh, organization, which means there's no central, there's no central Food Not Bombs thing. If you want to become a Food Not Bombs chapter, you just say, I'm a Food Not Bombs chapter, and then you can confederate with other chapters to, uh, to do things, and that's the, the nature of what, what anarchism is. And Food Not Bombs cooks vegetarian food and distributes it for free to homeless people. And it also, another but less known function of Food Not Bombs is to cook for demonstrations. If there's a mass demonstration of some kind for a good purpose, Food Not Bomb will cook food. And Keith and I once cooked food for 10,000 people uh, in, in Washington, D.C., there was a gigantic rally and march to free all political prisoners that were still held in the United States, you know, mostly former Black Panther Party members. And so we cooked for 10,000 people. We yeah. were just cooking and cooking and cooking. But that's another little-known function of Food Not Bombs is to uh, uh, cook for, for mass demonstrations like that. And Food Not Bombs was uh, founded around the uh, activists from the Clamshell Alliance that were protesting against uh, nuclear power plants. And the rest, as I say, is history. And I don't want to ruin his speech. And I could give his speech for now. <laughs> you could, you could. <laughs> but one of the great men, Mr. Keith McHenry. <laughs> Thanks, Carl. He forgot to say I have a fort in Baltimore, but. Uh, we're, we're hoping to get it back. Um, <laughs> uh, cool. So anyway, thanks so much, everyone, for coming. And um, you know, the the first thing that I like to uh, tell people is about how it started, because the idea of explaining how it started it gives you the impression that anybody really uh, with no resources can start projects that can ultimately go global. And I was 22, and the other volunteers, the other uh, seven of us in Food Not Bombs in the first collective were um, in our early 20s, you know, like maybe 20 to 23 years old. And we had virtually no resources at all. You know, we were workers, students. And, um, and wh where I was going to school was Boston University. And I was studying painting and sculpture, but I also took academic classes. And one of the academic classes I took was American history um, with uh, Professor Howard Zinn. And uh, he wrote a book called The People's History of the United States. And he would talk about how he was going to these demonstrations against nuclear power. He was part of Clamshell Alliance. And he would share his uh, adventures as part of the class because he talked about Shays' Rebellion and all these other historic protests, the Boston Tea Party, things like that. And he was just showing how this movement wasn't, didn't stop in the history books, but was continuing. And that he himself was a part of it, and they were trying to stop Seabrook Nuclear Power Station in New Hampshire. And so I started to go up with my classmates to those protests. And on May 24th, 1980, one of my friends, Brian, was arrested and uh, he was a law student, and we were worried he wouldn't be able to pass the bar and be an activist attorney. So what we uh, started doing to raise money for his legal defense was uh, bake sales at the student union. And back then, unlike now, where uh, food service is privatized by these large corporations on campuses, you know, you could get away with doing bake sales at the Boston University uh, Student Union, and no one would bother you. And so. Uh, but the th problem was that students weren't that interested in our baked goods, so they would not give us any money, and they would not buy them. <laughs> and so we really were making no money. And uh, like uh, many students, we had other ways of making a living. And another project we had, we had this old van 
and to keep it on the road and to uh, help raise funds for our, our living expenses, we had a moving company called Smooth Move. And so we were moving this family, and they turned out they were going to throw away this nice poster that said, wouldn't it be a beautiful day if the schools had all the money they needed and the Air Force had to hold a bake sale to buy a bomber? And we thought, wow, that's such a cool idea. So we went down to the Army-Navy surplus store in Central Square. We bought some military uniforms. We made little general badges. And then we went down with our sign and our baked goods, and we set it up and said, hey, help us. We're trying to buy a bomber. We're trying to buy a bomber. <laughs> And in those days, uh, uh, Ronald Reagan had been elected, and it was kind of common knowledge that a bolt for a bomber cost $1,500 or more, but you could go to the hardware store at the corner and buy one for 30 cents. So we had our little bolt on the table, and we say, look, we've already sold enough cookies to buy a bolt. We're doing real good. Help us out. And people would go by and go, man, you don't really look like uh, you're in the military. You look kind of like hippies or something. And we're like, oh, no, we're down our luck. You know how it is. We need, to, we need money. And uh, then eventually we'd admit to what it was we were trying to do and why we're out there. And we talk about Brian and nuclear power and nuclear war and all those ideas. And uh, the, another uh, way of making a living that I had was working as a produce worker at uh, Bread and Circus, which was one of the earliest kind of whole food types, uh, commercial grocery stores, organic uh, natural food stores. And so um, I, people didn't really understand organic, so they were throwing, a, you know, they wouldn't buy it, uh, all of the apples that were odd shapes or odd names and stuff, things like that. So I'd end up with all this uh, really wonderful organic produce that just didn't sell. So I started taking it to the housing projects a couple of blocks away from, uh, from where the grocery store is. And uh, it was on Portland Avenue in Cambridge. And I'd be there talking to the people after I'm handing out the food and we're all going through it, looking at it, and people are asking me questions about it. And then at one point I like, asked, like, what's this brand new building they just completed across the street from you guys? And they're like, oh, that's like where they uh, design nuclear bombs or something. So I looked into it, and it was called Draper Laboratory, and they were designing the guidance system for intercontinental nuclear missiles so that the U.S. could fire a missile from here, and it would go over to the Soviet Union and blow up all these towns. And um, that was like so stunning that they had all this money for that, but they didn't have money to fix up the housing projects or make sure those people had food. And so that gave us the idea to have the name Food Not Bombs. And then the final thing that really started to be, that really became Food Not Bombs was we found out that the board of directors of the Bank of Boston were also the board of directors of the company building Seabrook Nuclear Power Station. And they were also the board of directors of Babcock and Wilcox, which was designing the nuclear power station. And they were in the boards of the companies that were hauling the concrete and all these things. Plus they sat on the boards of Raytheon Missile Systems, Lockheed Martin and these other military contractors. So um, we got the idea that, wow, it sounds like the kind of arrangement the banks were doing in the roaring 20s that led to the Great Depression, where they're lending themselves money without public oversight. So, uh, and also just for their own personal profit, not caring really what the community uh, uh, cared about. So we uh, decided that we would take some of the food I was taking to the projects, uh, just uh, you know, siphon a little bit of it off, make a huge pot of organic uh, uh, vegetarian soup, and then we would dress up like hobos, go down to the stockholders meeting at South Station, and hand out information saying that the policies of the Bank of Boston could lead to a future where Americans might have to stand in line to eat at a soup kitchen. And so uh, we're making all this great food, and we're starting to look at this big pot full of food going, oh, my God, there's only eight of us here. This might be so much food that it'll go to waste. That would be a shame. And so we should find some people that might want to enjoy it. And also it would be more helpful to have more people there so it looked like a soup wine. So we had heard of this one shelter called the Pine Street Inn in the South End. We, I went down there at midnight and I got the uh, uh, managers to let me give a little speech. I told them why we're having this protest against the Bank of Boston and they were like, oh that's great, a protest like the 60s. And so the next thing we knew, the net, when we're out there serving food, all these people start showing up and they're like, uh, and before long we have people from the inn, business people, uh, some of the stockholders, all hanging out with us, eating the soup and talking about the policies of Bank of Boston and all this kind of stuff. And the homeless guys were like, you know, there's no food for people living on the streets in the city. It would be great if you did this every day. 
So then when we went home and were washing the pots and pans, we thought, oh yeah, we should do this every day. That's a great <laughs> idea. And so we decided we'd quit our jobs. And so I go to Bread and Circus and give two weeks notice and say, can I still pick up the food? And he says, yeah, that's cool, not a problem. And so uh, we started a little uh, system where we would go in the Smooth Boo van all around the city, picking up food that couldn't be sold from not only Bread and Circus, but from the food co-ops and from the bakeries and so on. And then we would go to the housing projects and they'd know we were coming on a certain day to their project. And we'd go to the community room and we'd work this all out with the people that uh, uh, manage the community centers at these public housing. And we'd bring all this free groceries to everyone. And then in the afternoons, we would make a huge amount of food, go out onto the streets, and we'd set up a literature table. And we had a couple of friends, uh, Bobby and Sue, that would play drums to bring like a crowd together for us and then we would uh, you know eventually once a lot of people were eating with us we start doing puppet shows and we did uh, um, like all kinds of uh, we made little super 8 movies we project on sheets that we tie behind us and it was like this huge little f like this kind of uh, daily festival and the uh, uh, one day we uh, were doing this in Harvard Square and these people come and they set up a pop-up tent next to us and it says uh, take the Pepsi challenge and it turns out that uh, just around this time, uh, there was all these ads about how you could go and get blindfolded and taste a little bit of uh, one soda, a little bit of another soda, and figure out which is Coke and which is Pepsi. And what they were doing was hiring college students to open cans of Coke the night before so that they would go flat. And so uh, sure enough, this whole uh, group of people would start walking by our table. Well, around that same time, we had uh, got a moving job with the New England Free Press, and in exchange for moving them from one building to another, they gave us all the posters and flyers that they had overprinted. And one of those posters was about how Coca-Cola hired death squads to kill labor organizers in Guatemala. And it turned out a dentist had just come by and he said, look, this is my last day as a dentist. I'll give you all these cups if you need them. And they were just the same as the Pepsi Challenge cups. So we well, decided, uh, also at the same exact time, White Wave was this manufacturing company making tofu. And they had to make the tofu in little, to fit in these little boxes. And if it was too big or a corner fell off or something like that, they just throw it in this white bucket and, uh, and uh, often just throw it away. But we made arrangements to get all these chunks of tofu. And so that's how we came up with the idea with making tofu spread. So the first thing you do is you add tofu to, to your uh, bowl for a tofu spread. So then the other thing you can do besides tofu spread is make tofu smoothies. So we had all this fruit, so we started blending the tofu and, uh, and, and uh, bananas and apples and stuff, and we make these tofu smoothies. And then it came, we got the idea, since there's the Pepsi challenge next to us, we might as well have the tofu smoothie challenge. <laughs> so as everybody would start, go by our table, we'd go, hey, take the Pepsi challenge, or the tofu smoothie challenge, there's more tofu, uh, protein in this one cup of uh, tofu smoothie than all the Pepsi products on earth. And here's a brochure about how Coke's hiring death squads to kill labor organizers. And the people were going, whoa, that doesn't sound right. We didn't see this on TV. And uh, it was like so much fun. And then eventually the Pepsi challenge people call the uh, police and the police come and they're like, what's wrong here? What's wrong here? And they go, well, these guys are doing the tofu smoothie challenge. We can't have that. <laughs> and um, and the cop goes, well, you know, they're friends with City Hall. They have a refrigerator in the basement. I don't know if you can really get rid of them. If you uh, don't want this happening, you should maybe just move to another corner. And then after a couple of days, unfortunately, they move to another corner, and they give us the middle finger and march off really angry. And so we have to come up with more street theater uh, ideas after that. And the things we were protesting were like the war in El Salvador, uh, the nuclear arms race. There was, uh, um, you know, people were uh, struggling to uh, free themselves from the Shah in Iran. Things like that were happening. And we were like trying to have uh, uh, events that uh, express these ideas. And there's already organizing against climate change. There was efforts to have like solar power and wind power, uh, organic uh, farming, things like that. And so that was what our literature talked about. That would be the street theater we were doing was about these subjects. And it was like really amazing. And as Carl was saying, we also would take uh, food to these big protests, like in Washington, D.C., New York City. Uh, on June 12th, uh, 1982, there was this giant protest 
uh, uh, on the second special session of the United Nations on nuclear disarmament. And we fed that protest. Over a million people showed up in the Great Meadow in, in uh, Central Park in New York City. And needless to say, we could not feed all a million people. And um, so that's the kind of stuff we did in, in Boston for the first eight years. And actually, people are still doing it to this day. But then I moved uh, to San Francisco in 1988. And uh, at that same time, we got a, uh, a, um, a grant from an organization called American Peace Test to provide food for 10 days at the Nevada test site to protest uh, underground nuclear testing that was happening at Yucca Flats in Nevada. And so with that equipment, with that money, we bought a bunch of miso, and that's the next thing you would put into the tofu spread. And we, the reason we got miso is we had read in the book of miso that the uh, monks in, uh, in Japan didn't suffer uh, radiation poisoning from the atomic bombing at Hiroshima and Nagasaki because they had a diet of miso. And so we thought, well, if we're going to be at the test site, we should bring miso out, and that will help the protesters that are out there. So then we, um, after uh, we're out there, and these young women come up to us, and they go, oh, wow, food not bombs, that's really crazy. We made a giant banner that said food not bombs. We snuck out into ground zero in the test site, placed it over top of where the bomb was supposed to go off, with rock, holding it down with rocks. So when the military flew over, they would see the words food not bombs. This is really crazy. And then a few uh, minutes later, another group of people come up, and they go, Wow, food not bombs. We'd heard about you guys, but uh, um, we're handing out free food in Long Beach, California, and uh, and um, we we're calling ourselves bread not bombs because we didn't want to be sued by the, whoever food not bombs was <laughs> for stealing their name. And we're like, oh no, take our name, use it, take our logo. Then we'll have three groups: one in San Francisco, one in Boston, and one in Long Beach. So they were psyched by that. So now all of a sudden, there's food, three food not bombs chapters. So uh, we go back to San Francisco and we set up at the entrance to Golden Gate Park, where all these tourists walk by when they come see the hippies on uh, uh, Hay Street and all that. And there's a lot of people now, because it's eight years of Ronald Reagan, now there's homeless people living in Golden Gate Park. And uh, all the workers come down there and have lunch and everything. And we found out there was no meals being served on Mondays, even though there were meals the other days in the Haight-Ashbury. So we decided to be there every uh, Monday from noon to two, uh, doing street theater, having music, having our literature table, and handing out free food to people. And it's going really good. We're having a great time. Uh, every once in a while, the Grateful Dead would come through town, so we'd end up with a couple hundred extra people eating with us. And, and uh, it was a great scene. And then uh, one day, this hippie comes by, and he goes, oh, wow, you can get a permit to do this if you write the Parks Department. We're like, oh, that's really cool. So we send a letter to Mary Burns at the Parks Department. Welcome, you guys. And, um, so, and uh, saying, well, we're doing street theater. You'll really love this. We did this in Cambridge for years. They loved us. You'll love us. It'll be great. And uh, send us our permit. And so uh, we don't hear anything about it. We go by the office every once in a while. I ask them about this permit. They don't know what we're talking about. But if something comes up, we'll uh, call you. And then on August 15, 1988, we're set up, we're ready to go, and all these riot police come out of the woods. Uh, 45 riot police come out of Golden Gate Park and arrest nine of us for serving food without a permit. And it turns out they tell the San Francisco Chronicle they're going to do this. So the next day, on Tuesday the 16th, there's a big photo of riot police guarding the food from the hungry with a headline saying, Nine volunteers arrested feeding homeless at Golden Gate Park. And so people start to call us up going, how can we get arrested with you guys? This is fantastic. <laughs> and uh, it turned out we'd been taking notes on how we started the San Francisco Food Not Bomb so people could do it in other cities since we met the kids from, from Long Beach. And, and uh, so that night we end up having a meeting. And we say, why don't we do this? We'll uh, meet at the end of Haight Street next Monday. We'll tell everyone to come. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, David Soldat, made this really cool flyer with the photo from this chronicle on it and put it all over town. And sure enough, 150 people show up the next Monday. And we urge people to bring spoons and pots that they could use as uh, instruments and to bang as we're marching down the street. So we march down Haight Street and we're led, uh, the, the procession is led by a guy who did a painting of Spock from Star Trek. And so he's holding his painting, and we're all marching behind him. We're banging on the instruments. We get to the end, and sure enough, uh, the police arrest 27 of us. 
And this time there was a new TV company called Cable Network News. And they got uh, broadcast this all over the, the world. And uh, Mayor uh, Aliotto, who uh, the former mayor of San Francisco, was on vacation in Italy. And he's watching CNN going, oh my goodness, what's happening to my city? There's riot police arresting people for feeding the hungry. And all of his family's like, you your city's crazy. <laughs> and uh, it turned out also the London Times, the New York Times, the Times of India, all um, did uh, articles about this. And so people will start to write us and call us from all over the world asking if they could uh, start a Funat Bombs and get arrested in their community. <laughs> so we took the notes that we had made, uh, made a flyer called Seven Steps to Starting a Funat Bombs that we'd send to you so you could get arrested in your community. So, hey, way, way to go. So, uh, anyway, um, <laughs> can we introduce you? Yeah. So, uh, so anyway, the, uh, uh, the next week, there's about 500 people show up. And we march down the street. We get to the end. We set up the table and everything. And the uh, police come out, and they hold a press conference. And they say, well, we don't mind that they're feeding the hungry. It's that they're making a political statement, and that's not allowed. So we'll provide muni buses to, you, to food not bombs. We'll take all the homeless out to the armory at the ocean. You can feed everybody in there. But you can't be out here with literature and banners and stuff like that. We don't know what they're thinking. And so the media comes to us and says, yeah, what are you thinking? And we go, well, we're thinking that with 50 cents of every federal tax dollar going to the military, there's no reason anyone should live in Golden Gate Park or have to eat at food not bombs. And that our, our idea is, since there's the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, right to free speech and assembly, that we should be out here trying to convince the public that maybe we should change our, our priorities as a country. And so it turns out the next week is uh, Labor Day, and it's a holiday on Monday. And uh, there's this huge uh, free food giveaway about a block away called A La Carte in the Park, where all the biggest, fanciest, most expensive restaurants in the city are handing out free food. And over on our side, we're marching down Hay Street with our little painting of Spock. And we arrive, we set up, and this time the police arrest uh, 54 of us. And over, nearly 2,000 people show up to get arrested, but the police burn out after the first 54. <laughs> so the next day, the mayor's office calls us. Hey, we want to meet with you guys. Now they're really feeling a lot of pressure. So they say, we meet with the mayor's office. And then after two days, they issue us a permit so they can stop arresting us. So now we have so many volunteers and so many people want to eat with us and there's so many food donations that we decided we'll do uh, also Tuesdays and Wednesdays in San Francisco. And a group started in Victoria, British Columbia, Washington, D.C., New York City. So then the next week we, uh, um, so now we're like having this great scene and, and the next summer in June uh, people come to us and they say, hey, the police have come and said they have to we have to leave San Francisco or rent an apartment. And uh, they keep telling us more uh, stories about how the animal control came and took their pets. The fire department got them all wet in the middle of the night because the police said that there was a fire and stuff like that. And they said, we've been watching those students over in China in Tenement Square. And we're going to do the same thing over here in front of City Hall. We're going to start camping out and having a vigil there. We're going to call it Tenement Square. And so on the third day, they come to us and say, hey, can you uh, help us out? We can't leave our tent city protest, our occupation, or uh, the police might take our belongings. It would be a big help if you deliver food. So we have a little meeting again, and we say, let's set up a 24-hour-a-day vegan restaurant in front of City Hall. So we go over there, and we start serving food 24 hours a day, and then every day at noon when the mayor and the politicians came out of City Hall, there'd be a homeless ballet or homeless poetry readings and homeless uh, uh, concerts and stuff. It was like this amazing scene, and we got uh, uh, portable toilets. We had a little library. We had like a little medical tent. Um, every night uh, after dinner, we'd have a general assembly and make decisions by consensus as a community. And it was just this really, really cool scene. Then on the 27th day, the mayor announced that he had a solution for the homeless, that they could all move to the new shelter at this Jaguar dealership. So with the help of some riot police, we pack up all our belongings and move down to the new shelter. When we get there, they say, oh, wow, you, uh, you forgot to bring your cardboard boxes. There's no mattresses here. You don't want to sleep on the cold cement floor, do you? And, they, and then the people, they go, oh, wow, you brought your wife and children. This is for men only. You, you know, who told you you could bring your family? And uh, then people with dogs and cats, they say, oh, you can't have pets here. You have to take them to the pound and have them put to sleep. What are you thinking? And so uh, 
at the end, then people were asked about the meals. They go, meals? We don't have meals at this thing. This is just an empty uh, uh, automobile dealership. What are you talking about? And so we figure, well, this is not really the solution to the homeless that the mayor had promised. So we go make uh, lunch. We go down to City Hall, and we, because we're now feeding about five, 600 people every day, um, we figure, well, we're obligated to keep feeding these people. And we show up at noon where we get arrested and all of our equipment's taken. So 16 of us are arrested. So now we're like really discouraged. So while we're making dinner, we decide, why don't we do this? We'll divide the food into thirds and we'll put some of it in plastic buckets so that if it's taken and we won't lose our pots. So uh, we have like three or four volunteers come out with a little bit of food and a little cardboard sign saying food up bombs and the police arrest them and take them away. Then we come out with a little bit more food, another cardboard sign, cops arrest them, take them away. And then while uh, they're booking those guys and the captain's going, that's great, you stop food not bombs, way to go. We uh, come out with all the rest of the food and feed everyone that shows up. So uh, this goes on every day, twice a day. And after a month or two, we're starting to burn out. We're like, wow, we're never gonna make it if we have to do this every day. And um, so he said, why don't we start a new program called Risk Arrest One Day a Month with Food Not Bombs. So the first group to come out is a group of uh, nuns and priests. And they get arrested, and the cops pat down the nuns, because you know nuns with guns is really dangerous. <laughs> and then they come out with uh, the teachers' union comes out, and they get arrested. And the carpenters' union gets arrested, and student groups get arrested. And then this group comes, and they have this big banner, and it says, National Lawyers Killed. And the cops look at that banner and they're like, National Lawyers Guild, that's not right. And then they go, oh, so rest a couple of people eating and then scurry away. And this kind of thing happens every day. And then on October 17th, we're cooking all this food in the Richmond district. And all of a sudden, the earth starts to shake and the gas and electricity go off. And uh, we go, wow, that's a pretty big earthquake. We suspect that the police are going to be real busy with this. So why don't we take all of our uh, uh, food that we're preparing. We'll go down to City Hall. We'll get the propane stoves and everything from the... Uh, Tenement Square protest and we'll finish cooking dinner and and probably the cops won't bother us and so we get down there and we're preparing the meal and now more people are showing than ever before and uh, we have uh, Rainbow Grocery and the other natural food stores in town are now delivering food to us because the refrigerators are down and then after about an hour all these police, like every police vehicle in the city, it seems like, is arriving to the meal. And we're like, this is not right. It's right after an earthquake. And the cops get out, and they start walking towards us, and they walk right past the table, and they get to the end of the line, and they wait their turn to have dinner. <laughs> and then they show up the next day for breakfast, and they eat with us for the next three days. So those 300 arrests inspired people to start a group in Brixton, London, groups in Czechoslovakia, in uh, Prague. Um, that st group still shares every uh, week at the same train station. They have been for years. Uh, another group in Melbourne, Australia, which is still active to this day. And groups in all the major cities of Canada, so like Vancouver, Edmonton, uh, Winnipeg, Montreal, Toronto, Quebec City, and many cities in the U.S. So then we find out that San Francisco has been chosen to be the official city to celebrate the 500th anniversary of Columbus discovering the New World. And so Native people go to a uh, meeting in Arctic Circle, Alaska, and they decide maybe 500 years is enough and call for a protest. And it turns out that a publisher has seen our flyer, Seven Steps to Starting the Food Not Bombs, and they ask us to write a book called Food Not Bombs, How to Feed the Hungry and Build Community. And this is a good time to add uh, garlic. And so, um, so while we were do, uh, working on this book, we decided, why don't we organize a Food Not Bombs World Gathering? And we send letters to everybody and uh, that we know is doing Food Not Bombs to see if they'd like to meet for a couple of days before the quincentennial protest. So sure enough, um, people are interested in that. And so we have two days of meetings, and we decide we should figure out what the principles of Food Not Bombs should be. And we decide there's going to be three principles. That the first principle is that the food would always be free and vegan or vegetarian, and that it would uh, be free to everyone without restriction, rich or poor, drunk or sober. That the, um, the uh, other, uh, second principle would be there's no uh, presidents or directors or um, you know, any uh, headquarters or anything like that. And that each uh, organization, each uh, 
chapter would be autonomous and they would use the consensus process to make decisions and they would try to invite, uh, encourage the people eating with Food Not Bombs to participate in, in, uh, in the meetings and to help uh, organize the direction of each local Food Not Bombs chapter. And that the third principle would be that we would not be a charity but that we'd be dedicated to nonviolent direct action to try to change society so no one would have to live in the streets and eat at uh, Food Not Bombs. And so after that, we made a huge amount of food, and uh, uh, we went down to Aquatic Park, where Columbus was scheduled to land. And this time, the Native American community decided 500 years was enough, and they pushed him back out into the San Francisco Bay. <laughs> and then some of the Food Not Bombs activists went to the uh, Columbus Avenue Parade, and they stole the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria off the floats, and they were chased through the city by the Italian American Association. And then uh, we had a huge party, and uh, we gave books to people, and, and uh, people uh, left from San Francisco psyched to start more Food Not Bombs chapters in communities near where they lived. And then the uh, chief of police decided he was going to run for mayor on the anti-homeless platform. And then he's elected, he'll round up all the homeless people, he'll put them in a work camp south of the city with a sign over the entrance saying, work shall make you free. So of course he gets elected and he starts his quality of life enforcement matrix program. And we borrow a video camera from the American Civil Liberties Union. And sure enough, the police come, the special matrix um, team, they surround the homeless at the Food Not Bombs meal, they order them to take their shoes off and throw them in the garbage trucks, they take people's blankets and sleeping bags, they take their backpacks, animal controls there to seize everyone's pets. Some people are deemed to be uh, too mentally ill to be eating at Food Not Bombs, so they're sent off to the psych ward at San Francisco General. Others have warrants and they're arrested. And there's even a grandmother who has a photo album of all her grandkids, and the police see that, and they have to confiscate that, of course, so they struggle with her and rip it out of her arms and throw it in the garbage truck as she's crying hysterically. And we get all that on video, and we give it to the TV companies in the Bay Area. And a couple of days later, Channel 2 in Oakland airs some of this footage, and the mayor is furious. It makes his Matrix program look inhumane. So he gets Louise Rennie, the city attorney, to file a court order against Food Not Bombs for serving food without a permit. And he calls up Mary Burns at the Parks Department and asks her to delete the permit process, which she does. So now we start getting arrested for felony conspiracy to serve food in violation of a court order. And so now we call up the uh, nuns and the priests, and they've started a group called Religious Witness with homeless people, and they come out and get arrested for felonies, and uh, the teachers' union gets arrested for felonies, and we divide the food back into thirds again like we'd done before, and this campaign gets crazier and crazier. Now the police are starting to like beat us up for serving food. There's a special anti-food, not bomb squad, and uh, it's got getting uh, really insane. And then uh, we find out that uh, the National Coalition of the Homeless is calling for a uh, protest on Thanksgiving um, uh, called Housing Now. And what, at that time, there was a savings and loan crisis and lots of abandoned houses, just like the foreclosure crisis today. And so they were suggesting that on Thanksgiving we'd be, do a big action. And we had all these friends that were just evicted from a hotel that was a $25 a night hotel by the mayor's best friend because he now wants to uh, charge $300 a night. And, he, uh, um, and it turns out this hotel is right across the street from Glide Memorial Church where the uh, mayor is going to come on Thanksgiving morning, cut some turkey, hand a slice to a homeless person, get his photo taken, and then rush off to uh, watch football or whatever they do on Thanksgiving Day. And so we decided to sneak into that hotel the night before. And sure enough, when the mayor arrives in his limo, we hang banners out the window. And one of the banners says, Homes Not Jails. And this gives us the idea to uh, go around the city, write down the addresses of all the abandoned buildings in San Francisco, go to the tax office at City Hall, find out who owns them, and if it's owned by a family that just can't keep it up, we ignore that building. But if most of the buildings were, being, uh, were in litigation between banks and mortgage companies and so on. And so for those houses, we would go and put our own locks on them. And then at dinner, we'd make an announcement. Does anyone here want a free place to live? you'd be surprised how many homeless people want a free house. It's like so popular. So we say, meet us tomorrow at 9 o'clock at this address, and we'll give you a free house. 
So the families would arrive, we'd have the keys, we'd open the door, we'd let people in, and uh, the front, we'd paint the front of the building, we'd clean up the inside, we'd help them turn on electricity and, and the water. And the neighbors would go, oh, that's so nice, they're finally fixing up that old place down the corner. And so uh, according to the book No Trespassing, we had uh, uh, keys to 400 houses and we had uh, people living in between 100 and 200 of those houses. And so uh, after that, uh, there's a uh, Sister Bernie Galvin had been working with us and the coroner's office to collect the names of all the homeless people who had died on the streets of San Francisco, uh, mostly from hypothermia. And it turned out 150 people had frozen to death that year. We're going to read their names at a vigil on December 21st. So uh, I volunteered to call the media about this, and I call up the radio stations, and they say, oh, we can't take phone calls from food, not bombs. The police have been here and said that would be aiding and abetting and a felony. So we had a friend, Stephen Dunifer, who was a, uh, knew how to make uh, FM radio transmitters, and we made Free Radio Berkeley and San Francisco Liberation Radio. So uh, on uh, January 1st, we get this email from a group called the Zapatistas. And uh, we're up on Twin Peaks uh, with our radio station in a, in a Toyota camper. And we're going to read this communique from the Zapatistas about why they're having an uprising against the North American Free Trade Agreement in Chiapas, Mexico. And we're reading that on a radio station, and we start noticing a lot of police are parking behind us. <laughs> so we put the mixer and the mic down under the table, get out some hummus and crackers, get a bottle of wine, we light a candle, the cops look in, we're like, oh, happy New Year's, we're just celebrating here. And they're like, okay. And they leave, we get out the mixer, and we start reading about the Zapatistas again. And then the next day, we're in front of City Hall, and we got this big sign saying, Viva Zapatista, no NAFTA. And people are honking and all excited about we're doing this and and uh, we're handing out food like we normally do at lunch we had a few people arrested and then uh, these people come, this guy comes out with a cell phone and he calls the tow truck and we had not seen a cell phone before we we're really amazed he could do this and they take my truck away and so I go uh, into City Hall to a phone booth to find out how to get it back and uh, I'm in there talking to the tow company and the guy follows me in there the guy with the cell phone he starts smashing me against the wall and I go I'm sorry tow lady this man is smashing me against the wall. I'm going to have to call from another phone. So I go upstairs, finish locating uh, my truck, and uh, there's these nice businessmen at the uh, first floor of City Hall. And I'm wearing this chef's, and the chef's hat and this chef's coat. And I go down to City Hall, and they go, hey, Keith, we want to talk to you. And I go, yeah, what's up? And they go, oh, you're under arrest for assault, battery, strong arm robbery. And that's a strike under the California Three Strikes Law that just was, uh, came into effect on January 1st. So I'm like, oh, my God, that's kind of hardcore. And they take me away. And so I'm in jail for uh, dressed as a chef for a week. <laughs> and uh, eventually I uh, get out and um the, uh, by now, we have been, uh, it's been suggested by uh, uh, Howard Zinn, who worked with uh, Martin Luther King on the Freedom Marches, that we write letters to the Justice Department of the Clinton administration and ask them to send federal marshals to stop us. And also, we had been videotaping every arrest, and so we had a, a video called Funap Bomb's Greatest Hits that we sent to the um, Justice Department. We also sent copies of this and the wiretap memos and stuff like that to Amnesty in the U.N. Human Rights Commission, and the Justice Department sends us a letter saying, oh, we looked at the video, we read all your wiretap memos and stuff, we see nothing illegal here, so we're not going to interfere with the city of San Francisco at all. And so we give that letter to Amnesty and to the UN, and they say, wow, that's incredible, we're going to call you, uh, declare you prisoners of conscience if you're convicted, and we're working on a worldwide campaign to stop the violence against food, not bombs. So uh, I'm so proud of our little letter from Amnesty. I go through City Hall with my friend Jesse, and this one politician just hates the homeless, hates uh, food not bombs, and she slams the door, office door on me and Jesse, and a glass breaks out, cuts my hand. So I go to my truck to drive to uh, the hospital for stitches, where I get arrested again. This time I'm charged with assault with a deadly weapon. The witness, who was a city attorney down in uh, uh, San Diego that day, said I was trying to knock the glass into the politician's neck and kill her. And they said my third strike uh, was that I had stolen 24 Berkeley Farms dairy milk crates to use as a table. And uh, so now I'm facing 25 to life in prison. And my bail starts out at a quarter million dollars, then it gets uh, reduced to 75,000. And then finally I get to go to trial. And the same, my uh, trial starts on the same day as the first O.J. Simpson trial, which is why no one's ever heard of this. So I'm in a... <laughs> 
plexiglass uh, bulletproof box in the courtroom for the safety of the community. They got riot police ringing the back of the, you know, all around the courthouse, uh, courtroom. Uh, the judge is like, it's too crazy today. We can't have a uh, uh, trial today. So what we'll do is uh, we're going to uh, uh, choose another date. And he asked the clerk for a new date. And the clerk goes, well, October 31st is free. So we come down on October 31st, and there's little bowls of trick-or-treat candy all throughout the courthouse. The Funap Bon supporters put the candy in their pockets, they go in front of the courthouse, they hand it out, and they get arrested. <laughs> the judge is like, we cannot have a trial today. This is crazy. We need another court date. So the clerk says, well, February 14th is free. So we come down. Now there's Valentine's candy all throughout the courthouse. We hand that out and get arrested. The judge says, OK, we're going to have to send you to Judge Lucy McKay tomorrow at 9 o'clock. This is just too much. So we get there, and she's already drunk at 9 o'clock. And she's like, I don't know why they're bothering a good Irish boy like you. That's just terrible. What we'll do is we'll drop all, uh, uh, all 47 felony conspiracy to serve free food charges. Well, uh, you make up some felony you want to be convicted of so the mayor can go to cocktail parties and say McHenry's a felon. We'll give you credit for time served, all uh, 500 days. And, uh, and then you can write your own probation. So I wrote my own probation. I'm not allowed to kill anyone or bomb any buildings for 12 months. <laughs> so <laughs> so this is a good time to add tahini, I bet. And um, so anyway, after, uh, after that, we, get a, uh, we find out that this wonderful mayor is going to dedicate a monument at United Nations Plaza to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights on the 50th anniversary of the founding of the United Nations. And uh, unfortunately, though, he's having to arrest us and beat us at this site every day. So we decide to organize the second Food Not Bombs World Gathering. And uh, during this uh, world gathering, we have all kinds of workshops. And uh, uh, we had one workshop was how to start an indie media center. And we have figured out how to post photos and stuff on the web. And so we start uh, uh, indie media and IMCs. We also have how to make an FM radio transmitter, how to run a diesel vehicle on vegetable oil, how to uh, make giant uh, puppets, how to make banners, how to cook uh, vegan meals for a hundred, and uh, how to make decisions by consensus, how to do composting, organic gardening. It was amazing 10 days. And during those 10 days, there was, uh, the police made over uh, 600 arrests, half of which were for cooking and sharing food with ourselves, the other half for marching against uh, to uh, Clinton's banquet and things like that. And uh, a huge march against uh, the death penalty when uh, they were uh, planning to execute Mumi Abu Jamal. Just like this amazing uh, 10 days of, uh, of uh, world gathering. We also rented a convergence space near uh, UN Plaza. So when everybody came to San Francisco, they could locate housing and where the workshops would be and where the parties would be. It was just an amazing time. And there's a great video about it by... Uh, um, by uh, uh, on foodnotbombs.net. It's like incredible. It's showing all these actions. So then people uh, were so excited about this, they went home and they started even more Food Not Bombs chapters all over the world. And uh, then I get uh, facts from Spain. These anti-globalization activists have uh, translated my book into Spanish and they want me to do a book tour. So I go over to Europe and it turns out people there are organizing against the World Trade Organization, the Maastricht Treaty, the, uh, um, they were trying to stop the European, the European Union and the Euro, saying they would cause horrible problems of uh, poverty and environmental damage in Europe. And so uh, during this tour, we decided we'd organize a tour of North America called the Unfree Trade Tour. And so in 97, we, in November and October of 97, we went all around North America. We came to Seattle during that tour. Um, and uh, at each stop, there'd be a discussion. We should c go to wherever the World Trade Organization has a, uh, a summit in the, in the US or Canada and go there and try to shut it down. So 12 months later, the WTO announced they're going to have their first summit in Seattle in November of 99. So everyone that signed up on our contact sheet, we called them up and emailed them and said, let's like organize a convergence center in Seattle. We'll bring food. Let's try to stop the uh, blockade, the WTO. A, a whole bunch of us started this project called the Direct Action Network. We had a nonviolent statement for the blockade. And thousands of people came from all over the United States and Canada to shut down the WTO.
And then right after that, I get a, an email from this uh, woman in uh, Australia. She said, I've been making a documentary about Aboriginal people trying to stop a gold mine in the bush. And she said that there was these Earth First activists helping the Aboriginal people, and that there was a group, Food Not Bombs, that had been providing meals for two years at the base camp. And she said, I've finished this film, and now I want to do another one on Food Not Bombs, and I, and I want to know if you know anything about Food Not Bombs. I go, yeah, I knew a little bit about it. And he said, well, I'll fly over and interview you. I said, well, that's crazy just to talk to me. You should talk to people that do Food Not Bombs and eat with Food Not Bombs all over the world or all over the country. So she comes over, and while we're touring uh, North America, she wins an award for Best Environmental Documentary and has to go to Spain. And the punk band Kafka in Genoa, Italy, has translated the first, my first book into Italian, and they want me to do a book tour. So we decide to go to Europe and keep filming. And the first city we go to is Zagreb, Croatia. So we get there, and they're like, how come you're just visiting Zagreb, Food Not Bombs? We have six groups in Croatia. I'm like, wow, I didn't even know there's six cities in Croatia, let alone six <laughs> Food Not Bombs groups. And so all the Food Not Bombs activists from all over Croatia come to Zagreb. We prepare a huge meal because the next day is anti-McDonald's Day, October 16th. So we go down to the downtown McDonald's. We are serving vegan burgers and stuff. They bought all these uh, black... Uh, um, uh, balloons with golden arches that said eat shit in Croatian on them to hand to the kids as they came by. <laughs> Another animal rights group bought the severed head of a cow from a slaughterhouse that morning and brought it on a silver tray for all the people eating there. The cops thought this was a great thing that we're doing. And then the uh, Food Not Bombs kids said you should go and uh, visit the uh, uh, people in Serbia. They did Food Not Bombs while being bombed. So we went to Belgrade and met them at this place called Rebel Squat. And they're telling us, like, uh, one of the uh, volunteers talked about how he used to look out the back window of his house, and then during the uh, bombings, a uh, uh, cruise missile hit the, the uh, mountain behind him, and it just disappeared. Now it doesn't exist anymore. They talked also, they'd be cooking in, in their apartments, and a cruise missile would go past their window and then veer off and blow up a house next door to them. And then uh, they would uh, paint like uh, targets on their t-shirts and lay on the bridges over the Danube after they served their meals, daring the U.S. to, to bomb them. And Emma, who was a uh, uh, nurse, was telling us how they had just opened this new hospital because so many children were being uh, uh, born with like extra legs and arms and eyes and things from the depleted uranium that they needed a whole hospital just for people with severe uh, birth defects. And there was already over 750 children in this one facility that she worked at. So anyway, I had to go to the bathroom real bad, so they say, oh, we just used the crater on the other side of the building when a cruise missile went through the roof and it didn't blow up, and that's why the owners had to leave, and we just used that crater as our toilet. So uh, then after that, uh, we made, took all the food out to the street and handed it out, and the cops came and said, this is great. The people came out of McDonald's going, man, your food is so much better and cheaper than McDonald's. This is fantastic. You should do this every day. And then uh, we went over to uh, Ireland, and there was a big protest to blockade Shannon Air Base. And all the Food Not Bombs activists from all over the island came there with food. There's a U.S. lands there on their way to uh, Afghanistan and Iraq. And so we fed this blockade, and then the kids from Belfast took us home with them. And it turned out that half the Belfast Food Not Bombs kids were of Protestant background and half were of Catholic background. In fact, the person I knew from San Francisco, when he returned home, he was of Catholic uh, background. His girlfriend was Protestant, lived across the street. And when he went home to uh, stay at his grandfather's place, a uh, Protestant threw a bomb at him, and it blew off parts of his hand. So every Sunday, they would go down to the border between the two communities and hand out free food to anyone that came. And they also did this thing called Tools for Peace, which they uh, collected hand tools and pedal sewing machines to send to Africa. And then I went over to uh, Istanbul, and there, it turned out uh, uh, George Bush was going to come speak at a NATO conference. So we organized a Food Not NATO action outside the first McDonald's in the Muslim world, which is at Taskin Square, where those big protests just happened at Ghazi Park. And so the first guy in line turns to everyone and says, this food is fantastic. And, uh, it, and he turns out he's the manager of the McDonald's. So all the employees come out with trays of ice cream and Coke to hand out to everybody that came to the action. And uh, so then after that, we went to Tel Aviv. And we found out that Food Not Bombs in, uh, uh, started in Tel Aviv when a group of young people refused to join the Israeli Defense Forces. They uh, went to prison. When they got out, they decided to organize a refusenik conference, and they needed to uh, feed it, so they started Food Not Bombs. So uh, 
while they were feeding this conference, they uh, meet these uh, Palestinian farmers who invite them to provide food at a two-month peace uh, camp on the West Bank. And during the peace camp, they came up with this idea called Anarchist Against the Wall. And the day we arrived turned out to be the day of the first Anarchist Against the Wall action. And so they marched up to the wall from the West Bank, started cutting through one of the fences. Israeli defense forces rushed up, started shooting at the protesters, and they injured one of the Funat Bombs volunteers, Gil. And so they were busy trying to get him through the uh, checkpoints into Israel and there uh, to a hospital, and they end up forgetting to come and pick us up at the airport. But we finally connect with them, and we help them edit video about this day. The next day, we make a huge amount of soup, and we go to the Knesset, and there's a protest calling on all foods to be labeled that are genetically modified in the country. And at 5 o'clock, the Greenpeace activist comes out and says, yeah, they just voted to have all the genetically modified foods uh, uh, labeled in the country. And then I went back to the U.S. and I get a call from this woman, Cindy Sheehan, and she's uh, camping in front of George Bush's summer home in Crawford, Texas. She said uh, she wanted to ask him why her son Casey had been killed in Iraq, but it turned out all these people were starting to show up and she didn't have any food. So I call up Dallas Food Not Bombs and they say, oh, we can't come, we're being arrested every Sunday, we're really sorry. So I talk to Houston and they bring food for a little while, but they need backup. So I get my big blue bus with all my friends and food and rush to Crawford and we feed Camp Casey for the rest of the summer. And it turns out during this camp that we hear about a hurricane coming towards New Orleans. So we make a little web page, say foodnotbombs.net Katrina. We urge Food Not Bombs people to help uh, with the rescue effort after the hurricane. And sure enough, Dan from Hartford Food Not Bombs calls me up a couple of days later and he says, we got to this military checkpoint. They wouldn't let us buy. We need a letter of permission. So don't worry, Dan, I'll make you a letter of permission. I make a letterhead. I write a letter of permission, email it to him. He puts it in the window of his bus. They go back the next day to the checkpoint, and the military go, oh, that's great. You got your letter of permission. Way to go. <laughs> By now, I'm starting to get all these phone calls from, hi, the Red Cross gave us your number for food. Where's the food? And so we ended up mobilizing enough Food Not Bombs activists to have kitchens in 20 cities in Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama. And we fed people at the Astrodome and the Convention Center in Houston. It was this amazing thing. And then in, uh, I get an email from St. Petersburg, Russia, Food Not Bombs. They say they've been feeding protests, uh, uh, anti-racist protests, and serving every week in front of the downtown bookstore. And, and, uh, and the, the group of neo-Nazis came, started stabbing the Food Not Bombs volunteers with knives, and they end up killing the founder of St. Petersburg Food Not Bombs, Tumur. So then we get more emails from other Food Not Bombs chapters in Russia, and Nazis are attacking them, killing their volunteers. So at least four Food Not Bombs volunteers were killed in the, uh, during that year. And then we get an email and a, of a photograph of, uh, of an incident again in St. Petersburg. It turns out uh, uh, neo-Nazis set off a time bomb at where we're supposed to serve food at, at uh, 6 o'clock, but we were about 10 minutes late, so no one got uh, injured, but it blew up a flower kiosk and put a hole in the sidewalk. And I have a photo of that in the uh, Hungry for Peace book. And then around that same time, Christchurch, New Zealand, Food Not Bombs emails me. They're hearing about how there's going to be a big conference about uh, free market uh, economics and that they're going to try to have a free market zone. And so they've decided to start a really, really free market where they give out free stuff every uh, once a month at the park where they're serving food. And that idea starts to spread around Asia. And there's this uh, cool article about Jakarta uh, Food Not Bombs doing a really, really free market on Buy Nothing Day. And people coming from all over Indonesia to get free haircuts and massages and acupuncture and clothing and electronics, as well as the free food. And then I met Heather Flores down in Eugene, and she's telling me how she was gardening after Food Not Bombs one day, and she's seen all these truckloads of, of sod being sent off to Phoenix and, uh, and Las Vegas. She thought, that's crazy. That should be truckloads of food. And she decides to start this project called Food Not Lawns. And before long, Food Not Bombs groups are now taking over abandoned lots in their communities and, and bringing the people eating with them to garden those lots and grow their own food. And Homes Not Jails is starting up again. And then uh, in Florida, they start making this, uh, because of the housing foreclosure law, they start making these large group feeding laws. And one of our volunteers, Eric, is arrested in uh, Orlando, and, and the city uh, loses the criminal case, and they lose in the federal uh, 
federal uh, district court, but they appeal it to the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals, and then they rule against food not bombs. So now we know we're going to probably be start being arrested, not only in Orlando, but in all the cities in Florida where they have made these laws. And so uh, as we're preparing for that, we're also preparing for an occupation in Freedom Plaza on the 10th anniversary of the U.S. invasion of Afghanistan, just next to the White House. But now we start getting arrested, and uh, every day, every couple of days in Orlando, volunteers get arrested for feeding people in violation of this law, and Anonymous starts blocking the Universal Studios website, the Orlando City website, Disney World website, and the mayor starts freaking out because there's so much bad publicity, and all the business people are angry that their websites are, have pictures of food not bombs instead of what they're trying to sell, and so he announces, okay, I'm going to uh, stop the arrest, in fact, I'll even, they can come to City Hall and serve food anytime they want, and I'll even bring a, a pepper from my garden to add to their soup. And then when I, uh, I'm in jail during a lot of this time, so when I get out after 19 days, my in inbox is full of emails from Adbusters about Occupy Wall Street. So we start helping support that. And so uh, I end up getting uh, $500 worth of rice and driving from Taos, New Mexico to Wall Street and helping with that kitchen. I went to Freedom Plaza, to McPherson Park. I went to Philadelphia. I went to all these occupations. And I eventually go to uh, Occupy Boston. And so after breakfast, I've got a literature table. And these people come by. And they go, oh, wow, we're from uh, um, Cape Town. You know where that is? And I'm like, yeah, that's South Africa. And they go, yeah, we do food up bombs there. This is so cool you're doing it here and it turned out the only thing left from uh, uh, back in 1981 of, uh, uh, from the time we did our first meal was a little fire hydrant over by the Federal Reserve Bank so I'm like hey do you see that like fire hydrant there and they go yeah what's the big deal about that I said that's where the first food not bombs meal happened when we're protesting against the Bank of Boston saying that if their policies continued Americans might have to stand in line to eat at a soup kitchen and they might be forced to live in the streets and here 33 years later there's like occupations against the banking industry all over the world and sure enough I got emails from St. Petersburg Russia this time was much happier there's a uh, on uh, uh, the anniversary of the Bolshevik Revolution food not bombs snuck into the Aurora which is the historic ship that fired the first shot in the Bolshevik Revolution and they got past the guards, they climbed up on the mast, they took down the Russian flag, and they replaced it with an Occupy flag, which was a, a, a painting of a pie with a slice removed, with the skull, with the, representing the skull, and the uh, crossbones were a fork and a spoon. And so they get arrested, and they do it again, they do it three times, and uh, people like are uh, in solidarity in Moscow, all over the world, food up bombs, people are helping feed occupations. And then I go to Iceland, and it turns out when I get there, they tell me the story how Food Not Bonds was doing the table, handing out the food every Saturday. People thought, wow, we're not poor. Why are you doing this? This seems really silly. And then one day, it turns out that the prime minister, who is also the president of the National Bank, had invested the national wealth in the U.S. housing market, and they were now going bankrupt. So people are reading the flyers, talking about what is going on, and they decide, wow, we should march on the Parliament building. So after the Saturday meal, everyone marches off to the Parliament building. And then the next Saturday, they march to the Parliament building again. And it turns out there's a 7-Eleven of Iceland has a logo, which is a piggy bank, a pink piggy bank on a blue background. So as the Food Not Bombs kids climb up on the Parliament building during the, one of the rallies, they pull down the Icelandic flag, they put up the discount store flag, they get arrested, everyone marches to the police station, the, eventually the government resigns, and now they're crowdsourcing the Constitution, and they uh, voted twice to not bail out the banks before bailing out the people of Iceland. And uh, so today there's now uh, food not bombs in over a thousand cities of the world. And I have um, scrapbooks of food not bombs in uh, Indonesia where they're currently protesting the WTO uh, this week because they're having their meeting in Bali. And uh, the Philippines, they're organizing a relief effort uh, uh, because of the typhoon. And there's like great pictures on Food Not Bombs website of them setting up solar power installations and so on uh, right at the heart of where the typhoon had hit. And so the last uh, thing that we need to put into the uh, tofu spread is onions and, uh, and uh, a lemon. And then I'll add a little bit of coriander. And if you want, we could start to show the video about food not bombs in Africa. And it's uh, really uh, interesting that those kids in Cape Town 
coincidentally uh, emailed me just like two days ago before Nelson Mandela passed just to tell me uh, what all that was happening there. It was really pretty incredible. So, cool. Thanks. Am I in the way? And then after this, we can, people can ask questions and enjoy the uh, tofu spread. Great. Oh, cool. It's pretty loud at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs>